on the front of your public policy book, when you went through that vocabulary, probably none of that sounded earth shattering because at the end of the day, a lot of times, I think the thing that's hard for people about government is we use a lot of words that you know what it means, but you gotta make sure you assign the right meanings to it. And I think that for most people, that's the biggest challenge. So that's why I really like this system, this model, because what it does is it's gonna show you how American politics works. Like, like how do we go from the process of this, like people participating in the government, having this kind of policy impact. Everything I'm gonna talk to you about today, you probably are familiar with. We just wanna take it and put it into context. And then as we work through, so today I'm gonna give you an overview. And then after that, like unit one or unit two is gonna be up here. And then unit three is this, and then unit four and five and six. So we'll continue to always come back to this model to try to understand how things work. Um, I'm gonna, when we're done today, I'm gonna actually ask each of you to pick a area, sorry, an area, or a policy, something that you're gonna follow all year long. So if you are like really interested in this idea about building a wall between us and Mexico, then you're gonna take that and you're gonna apply that here. Or if you say really care about protecting banana trees, then you're gonna go through and you're gonna, you're gonna trace that there. So you're gonna pick something that is of interest to you to kind of apply to what we're studying all year, okay? All right, so when we start with the American political system, the first thing that I wanna distinguish is the difference between two words. We have politics and we have government. Those aren't the same. Okay. When we say government, that is our institutions. That's Congress, the president, the court, the bureaucracy, it's the, the governor, the mayor, the city council. Those are the people who are in office doing stuff for the government. Politics is a much broader definition than that. <clears throat> Here we go. Politics is who gets what and how they get it. That's actually like the commonly accepted definition of politics. When I say the word politics, um, Brian, how does that, what does that make you, like the word politics, does it have any kind of connotation to you or? Disagreement. Okay, disagreement. What about you, Parth? What do I think of it? Yeah, the word politics. Okay. Does it does it give you generally everybody? Does it give you a like a positive feeling or a negative feeling? I mean, like most of us, because we're not a super conflictual culture, we don't really like thrive on that. Plus, doesn't it kind of make you think like um, shady, used car salesman, somebody trying to get something, right? I what I want you to work really hard to do is to try to understand that every being is political, right? I think about my my eight year old and my eleven year old. And the methods through which they try to accomplish what they want is hilarious, like, like the, the strategies that they use. Think about those of you that live in a home with two parents. Do you have a different strategy for trying to convince one parent of something than the other? So you all laugh, right? That's politics. That's the methodology that you use to try to accomplish whatever it, ever it is you're trying to accomplish. So at the end of the day, our system has a structure for that to happen. It's a structure where people can get what they want and they use some kind of methodology. Some of those methodologies are legitimate, they're accepted, they're legal, we're happy. Others are a little scary and we have laws against them and we hope that they won't continue. Okay? And so that's what we're gonna work or where we're gonna start. When we talk about participants, you may participate as an individual in American politics. What do you think is the most common way that you that people participate in America? Vote, absolutely. Here's the deal though. If voting is the most common form of political participation in the average presidential election year, 50% of the eligible population votes in America. And that's an average. And everything else is gonna go down. Less people vote when there's not a presidential election, when it's a midterm election, where it's only Congress or governors, or when it's um, a tax ratification election for your school board, when it's um, you know a city, a special election for your county for something. So voting, while most common, is actually still not super common. So we're not a country where political participation is particularly high anymore, okay? All right, so let's say that we go past that though. What else could a person do besides simply vote? What? 
I could protest, right? You guys learned a lot about that in U.S. history. Not that we protest a lot, but there were time periods in our history where protest was really common, times where there's a lot of change, right? And we've been experiencing that lately, like with the Black Lives Matter movement. We've had a lot of protests and things that have happened. Um, you can do like sit-ins and petitions and all those things that you guys learned about in the civil rights movement. That was a time of like high political participation. So everything that you can remember for them, that was a time period, okay? What else could we do? If I am Donald Trump and I really don't like the direction this country is going, how might I as an individual participate? I could run for office. Right? So actually seeking office is a way to participate. Mm. And if you're not Donald Trump and you're going to seek office, what are you going to need to do in order to be able to run for an office, especially like the presidency? You have to raise a lot of money. So you and I can participate with our pocketbook. Mm. We can donate money. What if I really hate America? Like I hate this country. And I want to show a way to communicate how I feel about this country. What might I do? What? Okay, I can like try to like put some information out there in the media. Yeah, we'll definitely get there. So hang on to that media idea for a second. Let's go extreme, you guys. Start, revolution. Start some kind of revolution. So I could commit like acts of violence to try to say, look, this is what's wrong with our country. What I'm trying to get you guys to get at is political participation. There are valid ways like voting and giving money and there are like illegitimate, illegal, not accepted ways like acts of terrorism and bribery, right? But all of those are individuals trying to say something. And input is just a, it's a feeling. It's a, this is what I want. It's this right here. It's the what. What is it that I'm hoping is going to happen in our country? We also participate as members of groups. And really listen to me here because this isn't what a lot of you are thinking. This is not a formal group in the sense that you're a, like a designated member. It's not like a club you've joined. It's not like the National Rifle Association. It's a group to which you associate because of who you are, okay? I, being a mom, is like a huge part of my identity. And I'm part of the middle class. So I participate as a member of the middle, like a middle class mom. That definitely affects the things that I would say, right? Like, so my inputs are very much colored by the fact that I have these two little girls and I care about what happens in the country, so that's going to color my input. The fact that I'm college educated is going to affect that. My religion would affect that. My where I was born. What do we call all of those things? Demographics. Good. Demographics. So when we talk about a group, really what we're talking about is demographics. Next class we're going to start to explore how your demographics affect your input, but you guys, it's massive in our country. Certain demographic groups are more likely to participate. Certain demographic groups are likely to participate a particular way. And so politicians need to know that information because they rely on us for input. If they don't get the inputs from us, our system isn't going to work. Okay? All right. So we've got the input. We got all the feelings, the attitudes, etc. <clears throat> My little amateur clip art pictures, these are our linkage institutions. So this is a new word for you. But these are not things that you don't recognize. Okay? What is this? Political parties. Okay, so we have political parties. All right, this is what Burton just said. The media. This right here, this is probably the one you have the like less knowledge about. This is like the National Rifle Association, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. What do we call those things? Do you know? Groups. Interest groups. Good. And interest groups are actually kind of like a relatively new phenomenon in American history. Um, they weren't always present in the organized fashion that they are today. And then can you tell what this is? Selections. So, um, Maddie, will you flip back to the front of your book, and if you'll read out loud for everybody the definition of a linkage institution. Um, the channels through which people's concerns become political issues on their policy agenda. These are parties, elections, media, and interest groups. Thank you. So you guys have to know from here forward, that's what these four things are. They are linkages because they take 
the input, they take the what that individuals and groups have in our country in this democratic system of government, and they are the channel through which we travel to try to somehow impact the government. So I'm sitting here right now, and I, Shannon Rosenfeld, have a feeling about what should happen with um, education reform, because as a teacher, that matters to me a lot. So then these are going to take that information, but the thing is they're going to filter them, right? Like if, I, like if I start going to a political party meeting and I start ranting and raving about education reform, that doesn't mean that the party's going to adopt what I said. I'm like one person of many that's going to filter. So parties, the media, interest groups, they're going to take all of our input and they're going to formulate them in such a way to produce, like to communicate something new. It might be exactly what we said, or it might be very different. Okay, let's go back to our Trump example. So Donald Trump is running for president, so he is seeking to participate as an office holder. And his input is, we should build a wall between us and Mexico. So let's pretend that he wins the election, okay? So if he wins, the election then was a tool to communicate this thing right here, the policy agenda. And the policy agenda is what we're tasking the government with. He then steps into a different role because then he could be actually part of our government helping to formulate that policy. Here's the problem. If Donald Trump wins our election, is it because he said we should build a wall between us and Mexico? I mean, it might be, but it might not be. There's a whole lot of reasons. We are way more complicated people than that. So the thing is that our inputs, when they're communicated through our Lincoln institutions, those are important vehicles, but we have to understand that sometimes they're filtered in a particular way. Media, the way media presents stuff, do they always present it exactly like what we're trying to say? I mean, like, not at all, especially in this age of citizen journalists where, like, anybody can be a journalist and anybody can have a blog and put videos out there and call themselves a reporter where they don't necessarily abide by all the ethical standards of media. And so as a result, policy agendas sometimes can get a little bit skewed. Um, so the policy agenda, there's different things that we go through. First, we have to have a recognition. Recognition is saying, I think there's a problem. It's government saying, oh yeah, we see, like there's a thing out there. And then agenda setting becomes where it's this task now where the government says maybe that we should do something about this. Maybe we should take some kind of action somehow, some way, or we should investigate it. <coughs> um, what kind of things do you think are gonna impact whether or not the government's gonna respond to the policy agenda? What do you think, Gracie? Okay, good. Can they? Do they actually have any resources? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever gone on. If you go on the whitehouse.gov website, you can petition the White House. And if you, you can petition and ask for certain things to happen. And if enough people sign your petition electronically, then the White House will respond. And so a lot of them are really legitimate, but I think it was last year, a bunch of people petitioned to get a Death Star built, and they got enough signatures, and so the White House actually responded and said, okay, this is what it would cost the Death Stars from Star Wars. Um, they said, I, I'm not a Star Wars person, so I had to make sure I was right, but um, this is what it would cost to build a Death Star, and this is beyond our resources. There was one to get Justin Bieber um, kicked, like to take his visa away, so he would have to go back to Canada, and he couldn't be here anymore, right? So those are really silly, right? But individuals had used the media to shape the policy agenda in a silly kind of way, but they didn't build a Death Star because they can't, right? Okay, so then more practically, um, there are some things that are being put out there, like um, there's some things that uh, Donald Trump is saying that are clear violations of the Constitution, right? Like we're, they're not going to do those, some of the things he's saying, right? So realistically they won't happen because they're a violation of the Constitution, right? Or sometimes we have